Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to our second talk of, uh, on our Skin Dialogues on Beauty, uh, which is are intended uh, mostly for you, students of the Master of um, uh, Fashion Studies of University La Sapienza, and we are together again uh, with uh, UNICH, the Association of Tanners, and for the second meeting, the second talk, uh, we are talking about heritage. That means the cultural heritage of making of made in Italy, how it was developed and how it is developed now. We, you will see many different approaches uh, to, the, uh, to this topic. But before we start, uh, I'd like to um, introduce to you uh, uh, all of our guests. So starting from Fulvia Bacchi, General Manager of UNICH, who will introduce the lesson. Obviously, our second host, uh, Professor Romana Ando, um, coordinator of uh, our uh, of, uh, our course, our master. Then we will have, in order of appearance, uh, Paolo Amato, uh, maybe you have heard about him uh, on our presentation, the one we put on, on Facebook yesterday. He's the uh, owner of Leu Locati. Leu Locati is uh, a very old, it's more than centennial, more than 100 years old firm of leather goods working for uh, many important actresses and also for many royal houses. That means uh, included uh, the Royal House of England. So let's say that in, in, in synthesis, um, the bags of uh, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth are coming from the center of Milan, is actually in the center of Milan. Then we will have the honor and pleasure to have Michele Lupi, a uh, man's collection visionary of Todd's group, who has a completely different approach. They have chosen a very different approach, you will see, on the theme of heritage and communication. And then Tommaso Cancellara, who's the CEO of the Association of um, Shoemakers. So I will leave the floor to uh, um, Fulvia Bacchi for the introduction and then to Romana and Doc before we start. Thanks. Hello, everybody. I want to thank you for attending this second seminar with us. We are very pleased and I want to thank uh, Fabiana Giacomotti for organizing this, Professor Roman Andò and uh, Il Folio, the newspaper Il Folio. Now, before my presentation on Pompeii Tannery, I give the floor to Mrs. Roman Andò. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to extend a cheerful welcome to our speakers today. We are going to start the second event of this brilliant series of webinars promoted by UNICH, Conceria Italiana, Il Foglio, and the Master Program in Fashion Studies at Sapienza University of Rome, thanks to Fabiana Giacomotti's creativity and competence. It's gratifying to look around and see many students engaged in this event. They are certainly curious and ready to discover something new. I have to confess that I found the title of this seminar really intriguing and I'm more than thrilled to know what Fabiana has prepared for us. As I said, introducing the first sem webinar, this is really an extraordinary opportunity of encounter and dialogue between the fashion industry, professionals, scholars, and students in fashion. And we strongly believe uh, in, a balancing, uh, in balancing more traditional educational methods with experience like this, where the competencies and skills that are essential in the market are at stake. We have, uh, as Fabiana, who is uh, our teacher, uh, knows very well. We have teachers who, can, who come from the, the industry with hand-on and original teaching materials and methods. And before the pandemic, we organized, visited and experiences outside the campus in order to guide students in the real field of fashion. And we hope to restart promoting these activities soon. Uh, our institution will continue in achieving these goals and we hope to continue to do so thanks to the generosity of partners like UNIT, 
portfolio and of course thanks to our speakers today. I'm grateful to Fabiana Giacomotti for having created this event and I leave the floor to her to chair the event. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, now I keep the mask just for one second to introduce uh, to you again Mrs. Bacchi who will um, explain and uh, made a, a little bit of story, not not a story, but a presentation of the big restoration project they have started. Uh, I think then uh, more more than ten years ago now. We uh, started yeah, ten, we ten years started ago, ten years on, ago on but now I think in a very few months uh, we will be ready to show this uh, wonderful okay. place <laughs> in Pompeii. In Pompeii. So and now we have the video. So. Noi conciatori italiani siamo stati i primi imprenditori della storia che hanno rispettato la natura. È un principio cui non verremo mai meno. Un'impareggiabile cura per la lavorazione della pelle che ha trasformato questa attività in un'arte. Okay, and now I am ready to talk about Pompeii. But well, why to talk about Pompeii? Or better, about the ancient tenery discovered there in 1873, and about our project as unit of restoration and valorization of this uh, place. We have thought it is very, very important to talk about Pompeii because if the Italian tanning industry is now a world leader in terms of value, sorry, <laughs> I kick out my mask, otherwise it's difficult for me to speak. <laughs> because if the Italian tanning industry is now a world leader in terms of value, because we represent 65% at the European level and 23% in total world and as a high technological level, it is thanks to our history, thanks to our heritage and of course uh, even to something more. We are a country with an insufficient availability of raw heights, but we are becoming leader in this field for reason not only deriving from our tradition, but also thanks to our creativity and starting from the 70s to our investments for water treatment, sludge treatment, reuse of waste, whereas other European countries prefer relocate their companies abroad, especially in Asia. Today, uh, Italian tanning industry is real and excellent, and we are proud of this. So we are even proud to show our past. As of the, what you see in the video is the archeologue um, charged for the restoration of this place. It is very interesting because you can understand how for the ancient Rome, the tanning industry was so important because at that time, leather was not a luxury good, but it was an utilitarian uh, good. So it was used for shoes, for the soldiers, and for other things very important at that time, but not, of course, for fashion. And now we are excellent in the fashion field, in the design field, and in automotive field. If I am not too, <laughs> too boring for you, I can try to explain the, pla the place you are seeing in the video. Before of the restoration of the tannery, we started to, to restore the road, providing access to the building, the so-called Vicolo del Conciapelle. Conciapelle is, is the meaning is tannery, but the, the, the road of tannery, which is currently patchy and interrupted a result of a bomb 
which struck the archaeological site of Pompeii in August, in September 1943. At the same time, restoration work is proceeding on the areas and tools linked to the tanning of ice, as well as the summer triclinium, the banqueting hall, in which the owner of the workshop of the, of the tannery complex welcomed his guest. The various operations which together comprise the process of leather working were conducted in functionally distinct parts of the building. The washing of the eyes, which required the use of full smelling substances, was probably carried out inside the water-fed dilia below the portico, or perhaps on the banks of the Sarno, far from the complex. The tanning itself, however, involving the maceration of the eyes, took place inside 15 large cylindrical tanks, which were located in one of the rooms of the building. Finally, the eyes were beaten below the portico, and they are in the area they were worked in the small rooms, arranged one after the other on the east side of the peristyle, and separated from each other by low transverse walls adjacent to the west wall of the peristyle. And we can find also a triclinium for the guests, as I said before. I think uh, when uh, all of this uh, pandemic time will be finished, it should be completely ready, our tannery in Pompeii, and it should be very interesting to visit. It is a fascinating story, the tannery, the, the tannery industry in Pompeii that I have uh, prepared in this. Uh, I don't know if you are able to see. No, probably not because <laughs> I don't know if you see. And I can send you the story of the tannery of Pompeii so you can read all this story and also all the techniques that the ancient uh, uh, Romans used to turn the letters. I hope this is interesting for you and I thanks for your time. Uh, thanks a lot to uh, Fulvia Bacchi for this interesting presentation. Um, since we, many of you come from places like India or Pakistan, where uh, tannery is very important activity. I'm sure you will have um, some questions and I'd like you to send, um, and send me some questions. We have uh, the proper, the right space on the right hand side of your video. So you can send as usual some uh, questions that I will mark and then I would forward to our guest speaker. Now I leave the floor to Mr. Mr. Paolo Amato for his presentation and his approach, uh, which is very, which is a very at the same time classical and modern approach to heritage. And uh, um, I think that Leo Locati, um, the firm, is uh, is one of the heirs of. Uh, has a, 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 his, uh, the story of this company is mixed with the story of Italy and only Italy. So I leave the floor to him. Uh, you will have 10 minutes for your presentation. I will, thank you. Thanks. It's up to you. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, yes, we, we are a part of the history of Italy because we start at the end of the 19th century. We start uh, around 1870, but uh, um, we were the curator of uh, cover page of religious books. And then uh, we change and uh, we start to make uh, some bags, ceremony bags uh, with uh, embroidery, special uh, petit point. And uh, we made some satchels for the priests because uh, um, Mr. Luigi Locati, the founder of our company, uh, he had a passion for the art and they have seen uh, uh, the, uh, the 
the ladies, the queen at, at the Scala, uh, and the time uh, there were the uh, Austrian people uh, that uh, governed the, the northeast of Italy, and he was fascinated about uh, these bags in Petit Point. Represent flowers uh, and um, uh, ladies in the uh, in the gardens, and he started to make this kind of embroidery, and he started to make 225 stitches per square centimeter of embroidery, and then 361. And uh, so we started to make uh, bags uh, at the end of the 19th century, um, and then we uh, we passed the industrial. Uh, uh, revolution in 19, and then uh, the first uh, war, the big war, and then uh, we passed the second war, and in 1948 we started to, um, to, to sell in Japan, to export in Japan. To export in the uh, United States, we started at the end uh, around the 1920, but uh, the, 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 uh, in the Asia in uh, 1948. Because uh, Italy, Germany, and Japan lost uh, the Second War, we were under control of the American, uh, uh, and the Americans, and they checked. And unfortunately, it was impossible at the time to export uh, merchandise uh, against money. So we found a partner in Milano, who was uh, Rina, La Rinascente, and they import what we uh, were able to export. And, Rinascente paid to us. Then in 1961, Mr. Umberto Locati uh, founded uh, with my father-in-law and uh, Mr. Santi, Mr. Friend, uh, and the other big uh, men at the time, uh, pioneers, <laughs> and they founded uh, the first international fair, Mipel. And then uh, we pass uh, the, the, the problem of the internet uh, uh, in uh, the beginning of 2000, and uh, we are here. We, we make uh, some special products. Uh, many royal family use our handbags, ceremony bags. I, I take one of these, is uh, a, a bag with uh, real gold and silver, woven with the old loom that we bought in the, the end of the 19th century, and uh, is still in production. And this bag was bought from uh, the royal family of England. Queen Elizabeth used this bag a lot of times in different kinds of uh, uh, events uh, with uh, uh, the um, uh, royal, Ronald Reagan, uh, for example, uh, Juan Carlos, uh, in very important event, also with the, the wedding of uh, uh, Lady Diana and, uh, and uh, the king. Uh, and um, the, the son of the Queen Elizabeth. Uh, we produce uh, different kinds of uh, bags, uh, only handmade, and uh, uh, we produce evening bags in uh, very important materials like uh, exotic skin, like skins of uh, ostrich. We start in 1936 to, to produce and offer this kind of leather. Crocodile since uh, 1925, and uh, calf, of course, uh, lamb, uh, goat, and different kinds of material, plus uh, some kinds of, uh, of fabric like uh, silk, uh, brocade, and other different kinds of materials, but very rich. Uh, we are not a big company. The, we are located in the in the center of the city, we are very lucky because we are really 800 meters from Piazza del Duomo, so really downtown of the city. In fact, we usually definitely we say that we are in the heart of the city, in the heart of Milano. We produce not in in Italy, not made in Italy, in the heart of the city of Milano, and uh, we have uh, around 1,600 square meter of uh, company. So all the production is here. We have the showroom, manufacturing room. Uh, we create uh, our product here, and we uh, ship from here in all the world. So this is our very quickly story. Yeah, um, I'm wondering, Mr. Amato, if you have any presentation uh, apart from the on the back that you will show uh, that you showed us. 
Did you have do you have some other presentation or a movie maybe? Do you have do we have a movie? Yes, to, yes, we uh, have a movie. Start, Just I a think. moment. I, I I found two seconds. Mm -hmm. No, I think that we have it. Giovanna, uh, I, I talk with the... No, Fabiana, we yeah. haven't. You haven't. Okay, no, so no, no. Uh, Mr. Amato, I think it's up to you to show this, uh, the movie that you, or the presentation that you had prepared. Ah, uh, okay. Stick your mommy, Martina. One moment, because... Uh, uh, okay, right. We found the, 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 the video I asked to my employee to, to, to prepare. Because we sent yes. you. But if you don't receive, I'm really. No, uh, it, it would be better if you could show this uh, to us by yourself. If you, I, th I hope you have it on, on your laptop, on your computer. Yeah, yeah, I have it in my laptop. Uh, just a moment, I found it. Okay, yes. Maybe in the meantime, if you can, you can, you could tell us how is the, the question of real heritage, I mean, passing from one son to the other, from what father to son. Yes, yes. Uh, it's very important, uh, the, the and question. And how, how it has happened, because, you know, uh, some of the uh, Italian firms are so old, they are more uh, like yours, more than 100, 100 years old. I, so it I, means passing the heritage from one generation to the other. Okay, one moment. Mi cerchi il video che yeah. lo mandiamo noi da qui. Possiamo? Puoi fare? Sì, dai, ok. Non fai intanto il racconto. Eh, eh, our company name is uh, Leu Locati. Leu uh, means uh, L E U is an acronym of Luigi Emanuele Umberto, are the three founders, the family Locati. Yeah. Then uh, my father-in-law was a nephew of uh, Mr. Uh, Umberto. And then uh, after my father-in-law, me and my wife, and then my son. So my son represent with my daughter, the seventh generation. So. I think. Yeah. yeah, but you know, you know the story, the, the most interesting part, I'm afraid, is, is about your son, which was under age when he started designing and selling yes, his first bags. He, is it he, correct? He, yeah, he, he was very, very young. Uh, around, he was uh, 13, as, as far as I remember. 13 years was in the cover page of our... Uh, newspaper, Sole 24 hours, like Financial Times. And uh, at 14 years, he, he, he went in, uh, to, to Paris in uh, premier class. And then uh, he started to make a Mika. Uh, just to make the explanation to our students, I don't know if you know a premier class, which is a very important textile fair. Yeah, exactly. And textile and, and goods fair. And I remember the quote for your son of Manolo Blanik in your company. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a meeting with what Manolo, Mr. Manolo Blanik before, before talk with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, so in, okay. We are ready to show you our company. Okay. okay. Right. Can you see? Fabiana, can you see? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we start. Okay. This is the loom. This is a very old loom. So it is, it's made by... No, it's around two, two years ago, three years ago. Uh, the loom has more than 100 years. Mr. Amato, maybe you should explain the different phases because it's not so common to press uh, this is, uh, leather. the fabric that we can make with our loom. And this is, is uh, the construction of the reinforcement inside of the bag. 
And this is the old frame with all the holes and uh, the stitching by hand, the interior and the exterior of the bag. And these are the best that you can obtain. Here, crop, and this is Petit Point, and this is the Queen Elizabeth bag. Okay. No, no, no. Come si fa? Tornare indietro? Okay. So in this video, you have seen the possibility to, to see the loom, it's very old, and where uh, we produce uh, our fabric. Is a, in, the, in, uh, in the video, you have seen uh, also the combination with velvet and real gold uh, thread to make the bags. And uh, antique uh, frame with all the holes that we stitch by hand on the bag. Thank you very much, Mr. Amato, for your time and, uh, Thank you. uh, and uh, the time you gave it. So uh, get ready for some questions that will come later. And okay. I would like to leave the floor uh, to Michele Lupi. Uh, yes. Fabiana, just yes? a moment, please. Mr. Amato, you have to block your sharing because it's impossible for us uh, okay. to yes. share other video. Okay. It's okay? Okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you to you, okay. Okay, right, you wouldn't believe it that we have a, a questions. A question from uh, Alessandra Biancone, who asks, how has the communication of the heritage of Made in Italy become with the advent of, of the digital revolution in the fashion field? So uh, it looks like the perfect introduction for Michele Lupi, uh, Men's Collections Visionary of Thoughts Group, to whom I leave the floor for his presentation. I was, I, I have to tell you, in, incredibly struck by the, the, the last book that he made. And it, it is such a, a special uh, approach to heritage and the communication of heritage. I'm sure that you will uh, find extremely interesting as I have found interesting. Uh, thanks, Michele, the floor is to you. Thank you, Fabiano. Hello, oops, sorry. Hello, everybody. Here, uh, we have a video now, so if we can just uh, introduce our lecture with this video and then we, I will talk. Hey guys, hi, it's me, Ramat calling. I'm just back from the lab with 75 rolls of processed film. They look great. Oh boy. Yeah. There's a lot of things from Palo Alto, especially the hills. Remember up there, the dish by Stanford? It looks great. I hope we can use that at the beginning too. you guys big hug to no coat from new york peace out thank you very much so the just saw this uh, short video that is about uh, silicon valley so maybe it's a strange silicon valley because usually everybody thinks of silicon valley as a really really technological place but in reality we try to 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 uh, describe which is the real life in Silicon Valley. That probably is not 
a techno technological place as uh, we can uh, we can imagine. But just uh, to have a, a short introduction about me, uh, I'm a journalist. I used to be a journalist. I did uh, several magazines. I ran uh, GQ Italy Italia for um, six years, probably. Then I founded the Italian edition of Rolling Stone, that is not a proper music magazine, but um, um, a lifestyle magazine that I run Icon, that is a fashion lifestyle magazine, and then Icon Design. And two, two years ago, uh, Mr. Diego de la Valle, who is the president of uh, Todd's group, uh, called me, and he was interested to know if I could um, collaborate with his group because he probably liked the magazine that I, I did. And I, uh, so we met, we met for a coffee and he told me, can we work together? But I was an editor-in-chief of a magazine, so I couldn't uh, collaborate with a brand. And it was sort of a provocation probably from him because he immediately told me, asked me, maybe you can change your job and come to work with us in, uh, in the TOS uh, group. And at that point, I was really, really interested in that because he immediately told me that in his point of view, probably a company like uh, his, like this Italian big um, luxury and uh, leather uh, group, will turn in a um, media company because the digital age uh, can give you, can give to the company to talk directly to clients and to the people. And so the, 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 the newspaper and magazine still remains uh, important for the making of the news. But the, now, uh, since uh, five or 10 years, and now it's, it's clear that company and groups and fashion company and as, uh, other, as the other companies can uh, produce um, contents and uh, news and they can uh, directly talking with the people who are interested in, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the brand, in the specific brand. So uh, we decided to, to join this sort of adventure. And uh, so in November 2018, I joined uh, Todd's group and we immediately uh, started to think about what is the relation between uh, uh, a, a, a well-established and very well-known uh, company like Todd's, because it, it, Todd's is, is very well-known in the world for uh, craftsmanship and for handmaking uh, goods and, and crafts. But uh, it's very important, even for a, a really um, fashion company uh, with a very, very big tradition of craftsmanship and, and handworking, to start to think uh, about technology and what which is the relation be between the, the craftsmanship and, and, and technology today and uh, so we decided to launch this uh, a new brand that is called uh, no code no code uh, was launched in november 2018 just when i arrived at the at the company and the idea was exactly to find a point of balance between uh, craftsmanship and technology. So we thought that probably producing, at the beginning, no code, uh, we decided that was, uh, has to, to, to be a sort of a place where uh, thinkers, visionaries, or designers can express themselves. But the, the, the main goal was to find out how we can uh, manage the, the relation between uh, technology and, uh, and and heritage, and so we started this um, this brand. Um, uh, they're working with uh, this uh, a Korean designer. Um, he, the name is uh, Young Bae Seok. He's a Korean designer, but he was trained um, as a car designer at the beginning. Uh, he was working for uh, for um, Pininfarina. In, in, in Italy, in Torino. And then uh, um, we started to, to think about a new product that can emer merge uh, the technology and the um, uh, craftsmanship. So we, 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 we started with this shoe. At the beginning, the name was uh, um, Shooker. So the mix between a shoe, a, a traditional Todd's shoe, and a sneaker. Um, so using craftsmanship, 
using the leather group, the, the leather natural material that usually are used in, uh, in the Todd's uh, shoe, tra traditional Italian shoes, and the technology that is used for, um, for, for, for sneakers. So the Shuker was the first product between uh, this idea that we could give to our clients a product that was exactly the sum and the merge between um, between technology and and craftsmanship, or better, craftsmanship as a core business, as a core value, and the, and the technology. We think uh, we immediately started to think that, and now I have a, a, this a clear idea that probably we are entering in a society that is, could be also described as a post-digital. Because uh, um, I think even, uh, I don't know, till uh, a year ago, maybe uh, even today, usually everybody thinks as uh, the anal analog, analogic world as, as the old world and the digital world is the new world. But I think this is a little bit an old uh, idea. Probably the next uh, years, the, the, the challenge of the next years, I think it will be find the proper point of balance between the digital culture and the analogic culture. So uh, thinking about that, uh, we started, uh, and this, this um, idea of the of the of the no code uh, value that was hybrid so the the sum of these two world was probably uh we started to think about silicon valley because silicon valley is an inter interesting place and uh, is exactly the same um dna of of no code so uh, silicon valley is a sort of a, a hybrid place where they mixed the, the counterculture and the summer of love culture and the surf culture of, of California in the 60s and 70s and technology, or better, the son, the sons the, 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 of, 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 of the guys, of the, the people who, who did, the, I don't know, the summer of love in the 60s in, in California did and founded um, Silicon Valley and they were fascinated about technology. The origin of Silicon Valley was uh, that uh, at the time, at the beginning of six, uh, the end of 60s, the beginning of 70s, the big tech companies that were producing computers were in uh, Texas. But they were producing big computers for big companies. A bunch of adventurous guys from California, like uh, Steve Jobs, to mention the most uh, important one, most uh, well-known, started to think that probably uh, the microchip could give them the possibility to produce smaller computer and personal computers. So they started this fight and this adventure, trying to beat the power of the, of the, of the Texan company, and, and they succeed because they started to produce small computers as a, um, uh, personal computers, and they started to, 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 to succeed, to succeed and, 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 and win this sort of a business battle. And so when we realized that Silicon Valley was a sort of a um, hybrid uh, place with uh, art artisanal craftsmanship uh, culture, like the, the 60s California culture, culture and the technology culture, we said, uh, we have a sort of a uh, similar DNA. And so we, uh, at a certain point, Mr. Del Diego de la Valle, who is the owner of, uh, of the company, the president of the company told me, you did a lot of magazines and newspaper. Uh, we were at a dinner, I remember in Piazza del Duomo in 2016, I was, I was, uh, uh, or uh, I was at the, at the magazine at the time, and I remember one uh, at that dinner, Mr. De La Valle told me, but no, uh, jo any journalist uh, never did a story about Silicon Valley, which is the real life in Silicon Valley. So it's real, it's real a uh, technological place. Which car you can find at the car wash? Which uh, how they wear? Because as you as you know, they know. Uh, almost everything about us through the, the phones and the, and the devices. 
but we don't know anything about them because it's a really, really protected um, place and society. So he was, Mr. De La Valle has a really, really uh, strong journalistic um, sensibility. And so he said, maybe sometime a, a, a journalist has to do it. So when I went to the uh, company and started to, know, uh, to working on No Code, as I said to Mr. De La Valle, why we uh, don't go to Silicon Valley and try to do um, a, a research, a photojournalistic uh, a reportage about Silicon Valley, and trying to feel uh, the real essence of Silicon Valley, because it's always um, a result of this uh, mix and hybrid uh, nature. And, and it's obvious that we, we can't think a future world only digital. So in our society, it's always very important to keep and to use technology and the, the future is, uh, is absolutely technology, but you need um, to take care about the analogic part. And one of the things that was interesting, and when, when, when I went there with this uh, Iranian-American photographer that is called uh, Ramak Fazel, we went in, in, in California, in Silicon Valley, we arrived in uh, the end of 2019 in a very strange, really rainy night at the end of December 2019, so just two months be before the pandemic uh, disaster. And uh, immediately we realized that we were in a place that probably wasn't so technological. And um, we started to going around, meeting people. And the interesting thing is that this, this photographer, uh, he is using a, a really traditional, uh, it's called a Rolleiflex. It's a, it's a film and camera, it's six by six, it's six per six. It's a 60s camera with, a, with, a with a film, it's not a digital. But the most in, in, in interesting thing is that we, when we were there and we started, the first day we started to take pictures of these people around the Silicon Valley, we were at the big tech companies. It's very close, so it's very difficult to get in, but sometimes we, we were succeeding in that. Everybody was really, really, really fascinated about that uh, camera. And, and this, the strange thing is that when we were talking, maybe we had, we had a dinner with a, one of the founder of Facebook and Instagram, and all the dinner we were talking about did, um, analogic camera, old Porsches from the 60s. Uh, everybody were so so fascinated about the 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 the, the, the analogic thing. This is probably because uh, the digital world is so cold. It's it's really icy. There is no emotion about technology so it's very useful but I, I i immediately understand that all the the interesting uh, the interest of, of those guys that working a lot with technology were completely on the on the analogic uh, on the analogic side and so we we started to do this uh, at the beginning of this work of this bunch of um, 120 photos that we we did in silicon valley at the beginning it has to be an exhibition in uh, La Triennale, that is the, the most important uh, uh, design and architecture museum in Milan or probably in Italy. But then the, the pandemic arrived and so we couldn't do the exhibition, the physical exhibition. Somebody told me, ah, maybe we can do a digital thing. But I thought that digital thing is not the real thing that I wanted to do. So um, I, I started to think that uh, probably was a better idea to do a book, a printed book, because it's completely different to, 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 to send to the people that we wanted to, to invite to the exhibition. One thing is send a link in, a, in an email, sending, tell, uh, told them you can see these pictures uh, at this link probably nobody goes or it's not really interesting. Another thing is send a book, a printed book, very well done with a box, designed box, with a handwritten uh, card and uh, send to all the people. We sent that to all the people that we wanted to invite to the, our exhibition that we couldn't do. 
And what, that was completely uh, another thing. So it's important, it's very important, I think, to find a balance between all the things that digital can be useful and very fast. Uh, you can talk a lot with millions of people at the same time, but don't forget the analogic side because we are, it's very difficult to change the DNA of the people. So we are physically interested. We need, we love, we all love to see something real and, 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 uh, and physics. And so uh, that's uh, the point that um, was uh, the base for the, for, for the book. If you want, I can show you some pictures to told you, um, told you what, what, what we did and what kind of, of, of picture and people we, we found. So I'm going to, to, uh, to, to show you the pictures. Okay, so this is an interesting couple. Uh, we were we went in front of the of the garage, the famous garage where um, Steve Jobs founded the, the the Apple company. You know that uh, he was with Steve Wozniak, uh, uh, the guy who founded uh, with him uh, the the Apple computer, and they were working on a garage. We went there on that road in Los Altos. I remember. And uh, we immediately noticed that in front of the house, there were a couple of, these guys are around 90 years old guys. And they, they came to us and they said, ah, we, were, we, 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 we knew Steve since when he was a teenager. He always, uh, he, was, he was playing with our uh, sons uh, all the time in our garage. And, uh, and, and, I, and we remember that at a certain point, Steve Jobs called, called us and saying, ah, come to this garage. So we went there to their garage and Steve Jobs was handling a, a, a box full of uh, wire, wire. And uh, Joanne, who is the lady here, uh, asked to Steve Jobs, but Steve, what, what is that? And Steve Jobs said, um, re uh, uh, responded, uh, this, is a, this is a computer. And she said, what, what is a computer? And Steve Jobs said, um, it's a place, it's a box where you can put all your apple pie receipts. And, uh, and she said, no, no, I'm not interested. I want to keep my notes, uh, book, no, no, notebook to, to, to keep all my handwritten, um, handwritten receipts. So this, uh, it, we went through the Silicon Valley and through all this uh, small story, but was really nice. Uh, we can go, uh, this is the garage of uh, Steve Jobs, that white, uh, uh, behind that white car that is now is living there, I think the uncle of, of Steve Jobs. This is the, um, another garage, very famous garage where Procter, Procter & Gamble were, was founded in the mid of 30s. So Procter & Gamble was the first company founded in in California as a technological company. This is an interesting picture because usually houses in Silicon Valley are, are like this. So very small houses, very, very valuable. Probably a house like that can be $2 million. And, but the houses are very small because they are very, very expensive, but always two Teslas outside, parked outside. Um, the interesting thing about the houses is in the period, in the 12 months, in the period between 2017 and 2018, the value of the houses increased $100 per hour for 12 months in a row. So for one year, the houses were increasing their value uh, per uh, $100 every hour. So there are also people that are not very wealthy maybe working in a supermarket. They bought in the past houses for, I don't know, 20 or 30 or $40,000 uh, with their um, uh, small money. And now they own millionaires' houses. So the, the dream of Silicon Valley uh, is also interesting because people that they are not very, very wealthy, uh, they own anyway, uh, really million houses. This is another point and interesting thing. 
about uh, the, the problem of the price of the houses because in, in, um, in the center of Palo Alto, this is a road that is in, uh, exact, exactly in the center of Palo Alto, the, there is this in, incredible long uh, queue of uh, motorhomes. These are the places uh, and the, the motorhomes, the houses where people live because they prefer to live in motorhomes uh, instead to pay the rent that is really, really high rent. So we have this kind of social differences. So people that work in our normal workers in the big tech companies can't afford the rent of the, of the apartments and prefer to live in, in motorhomes. And this is the police. Uh, are signing, uh, are signing the, 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 the tires of the, of the, of the motor homes because you need to be uh, firm and stuck. You can't use it because if you use it, it's not anymore a house and they force to, to give away. This is a um, place, I don't know if I can, can go on or my time is finished because I, I don't want to go, go too much. <laughs> No, I have to explain. I, I have to explain something to you. But we have. Um, I have to thank. And this is a part of Italian creativity <laughs> to keep on with something that should have finished ten minutes ago. Sorry. No, no. But I asked Michele to go on because unfortunately our next guest is stuck uh, in a meeting that he can't leave. Uh, so uh, we are waiting for his video to come and I asked uh, Michele to keep on <laughs> so I hope you are very in interested in what he is saying but, and I'm sure you are because it's so incredibly interesting the, and the pictures are astonishing and amazing so I'm sure it will be um, happy to hear and we are getting ready with this new video so I ask Michele just another five minutes and get yeah, ready let's, okay, okay. And that's okay. part of Italian way of being <laughs> creative and dealing with heritage and uh, exactly making a lot of theater out of this great <laughs> so three minutes or four minutes this is a place this is another interesting story because this place is a really normal and, and very simple bar and restaurant but it's the place where all the uh, venture capitalists and people who want to do business in silicon valley goes to to discuss their their businesses and the waiter uh, told us when we were because we went there to eat uh, pizza and uh, it's a normal place that where pizza costs probably ten dollars and and the waiter said uh, when we were talking with her she said, um, yes, everybody, when, when I serve, when I mm, take the dishes to, the, to the, our clients, I always uh, hearing somebody who is asking his um, companion to the table, can you, can you, can you give me about uh, four or five hundred million uh, dollars to start a business? So they are always talking about millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in a really, really, really simple simple uh, restaurant and, and bar behind the girl she's a photographer um, that we met there there is the first apple computer from 1976 and as you say on the right is locked down um, this is another interesting thing that this, this is a computer of the of the bar so they like to use very very old technology because this is a very old panasonic uh, counter uh, this is the menu. So the interesting thing is that I went, we went also in uh, the place, the bar where uh, engineers from Apple and from the technological company goes after work to drink a beer and it's completely cash only. So you can't pay with the credit cards. And the, and the, um, the menu, as you see, it's really, really, really old style menu. Nothing technological with the iPad or it's really, really a world that is between technology and and um, this is and this is Steve Wozniak on the on the right showing the first uh, apple at, in that bar. This is the first apple uh, apple store. I tell me tell me Fabiana when I have to stop. Eh? No no no. Yeah, okay. I, I, I mean yeah, yeah, I always yeah, 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 almost finished. Yeah, okay. But um, 
Okay. okay, so this is interesting because this is the first uh, uh, Apple store in the world, is in uh, Palo Alto, and uh, is now a um, carpet shop, as you see. But they kept the, the image of, uh, of, of Steve Jobs. It's uh, an Iranian company, uh, family, who runs the, the business. And, but this was the place where the first uh, uh, Apple store was, uh, was, was founded. This is a, a company that is called uh, Plug and Play. And Plug and Play is an interesting company that um, the, 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 the goal of the company is to meet, to do the, the chance to meeting um, students or young people with good ideas and, um, and uh, big companies. And outside of the, row, and the room where they, they meet, there are these message uh, seats where they, because they have 100 meetings a day, five, five minutes each. So they are really, really tired. I think I my I run my time is finished. Thank you very much for okay. your interesting. And Thank your you. And your, your beautiful tale, your your beautiful telling, and Malfi, your kindness. This is that's, well, that was a very a proof of friendship. I can. <laughs> no, I'm really happy. So let's see. Yeah, and it was we'll absolutely see. so interesting because you know this is a, a, an interesting way to uh tell how the, the new approach to the heritage so yeah the heritage communication and working on companies that can yeah. producing straight the contents yeah i i, I ask you to yes. close uh the sharing so we can go on okay right. okay thank you okay. and the uh Michele will be ready in a few minutes for your so questions nice. okay. okay thank you very much thanks to you so Thank you again. So I just see that the art of, impro of improvisation, things happen. Uh, there is also another way of expression, but it is, it's a little bit bolder, so I won't use it. So um, uh, uh, as I said before, uh, Tommaso Cancellara uh, uh, can't absolutely be with us. Uh, he's still stuck in these meetings. But uh, uh, while uh, Michele was speaking to you and was telling this beautiful story, this super fascinating story, I asked the Association of Shoemakers to send us uh, this video, at least uh, for a little bit of uh, explanation of what they do. Uh, this is the association of, mm, that gathers many producers of shoes so you can see the video and then we can leave the floor for your questions that will be happily received so uh, if giovanna uh can thank okay thanks Made in Italy è una filosofia di vita, è una filosofia di vita che in Italia parte dal food e va fino alla calzatura, alla moda, eccetera. Per quanto riguarda le calzature, il nostro Made in Italy è prodotto nei sette distretti più importanti, che sono il distretto Lombardo, il distretto Veneto, il distretto Toscano, il distretto Marchigiano, il distretto Emiliano Romagnolo, il distretto Campano e il distretto Pugliese. L'eccellenza delle nostre produzioni ha permesso di attrarre le griffe internazionali della moda. Gran parte delle più belle scarpe vendute nel mondo sono prodotte in Italia. Noi diamo le fondamenta per poter costruire una scarpa che poi viene venduta in tutto il mondo. Quindi il Made in Italy sta proprio qui, sta proprio nel distretto. Questa è la nostra forza. Cioè il distretto di base funziona così, siamo dei piccoli maestri ognuno nel proprio campo dove alla fine diventa un'orchestra, ognuno prende la propria nota e la deve fare al meglio per poter costruire un'opera d'arte che è una calzatura. La 
forza del distretto è sicuramente l'innovazione che nel distretto tutti quanti lavorano nello stesso settore tutti quanti hanno voglia di portare un plus tutti quanti hanno voglia di portare un'innovazione è importante avere comunque delle relazioni strette tra gli operatori per far avere una voce più importante nel mondo con tutte le varie parti della filiera con cui ci confrontiamo quotidianamente. L'Italia è un paese dove i distretti si comportano e hanno caratteristiche differenti. Uh, il distretto marchigiano della calzatura è diverso dal distretto milanese, dal distretto toscano o da uh, quello veneto. Il Made in Italy era produrre all'ombra dei campanili delle cose belle che, che piacciono al mondo e all'ombra dei campanili è il distretto, il distretto italiano. Il distretto è un po' tutta l'Italia, perché nel distretto sono connessioni eh, forti tra le varie aziende che lo costituiscono, eh, in ottica proprio di Open Innovation. Serve venire qua in Italia a fare un prodotto così perfetto perché a noi ci nasce spontaneo, naturale. In tanti altri paesi magari la cura nel dettaglio maniacale come l'abbiamo noi, non la si trova. Fino a qualche anno fa avevamo l'idea di distretto che era il distretto locale, che poteva essere il distretto marchigiano, il distretto toscano, il distretto veneto, ma in realtà ormai non è più così. Per me il distretto è l'Italia, il distretto è tutto quello che raccoglie eh, il Made in Italy, il distretto è appunto il nostro saper fare a modo nostro le scarpe. Right, so uh, at the end, every, uh, um, everything ends well because we have Tommaso Cancellara with us. Obviously, the, uh, the meeting is fin has finished, so um, we have the, the, the double chance to see this beautiful video again uh, on uh, different sides of the shoemaking in Italy. So you, you saw different regions and I'm afraid um, the next time uh, a, a video in English will be ready, but we were absolutely um, in emergence. So uh, it was sent and done uh, in the meantime while Michele was speaking. So now I leave the floor to Tommaso Cancellara for his survey and a view from him on the evolution of heritage in the shoemaking in Italy. Thanks, Tommaso, for being with us. Ciao, Fabiana, uh, Fulvia, and everyone uh, in the meeting. I am uh, terribly sorry for being so late. However, I had a board of director with the entire Italian industry of footwear manufacturers, and uh, that was uh, really intense. Uh, we are living in such a unique period, and uh, a unique period require unique uh, uh, solution and we are thinking how to uh, come back uh, out of this uh, uh, terrible period uh, even stronger than before. Uh, now, Italian manufacturer production, uh, when it comes to footwear, it's uh, a uniqueness, uh, as well as uh, tanneries, as well as bags, as well as accessories, as well as eyewear, as well as many, many other uh, industries, creative industries. We are so proud of being an icon worldwide, the Italian shoes, more often referred as Italian leather shoes. But this is something that happened in the past 30 years, not before. Before, the creativity was still there, the heritage was still there, 
uh, the genius loci, which means uh, the incredible uh, intelligence of uh, uh, our hands and our brains in uh, the territories we are producing, it was a little bit more confused. Uh, it's only in the past 30 years that the Italian shoes became what it is today, meaning more than 4,000 companies producing more than 200 million pairs of shoes worldwide, being the 10th biggest producer, but the second larger exporter right after China. But do you remember how many shoes do we produce? I just told you, it's 200 million pairs. Do you know how many shoes China produces? I'll let you guess for a second. I'm going to tell you the answer, but remember, Italy produces 200 million pairs. How many, you ask? Very easy, 13 billions. Now, is this crazy? Because there are 7 billion people in the world. And so, not that easy to produce 13 billions. So we also have uh, to question a little bit the overall numbers. But Italy has certified numbers and we're pretty happy to be the second larger exporter. And when it comes to the average price of the shoe, it's the best worldwide, the most expensive, if you want to say. The average price of a shoe produced in Italy, of course, B2B, so all sale, it's around 50 US dollar. Our main competitor, the second most important when it comes to average price is Spain. And the average price of Spain is 27 US dollar. So we are almost double when it comes to the price. Now, does it mean that we are too expensive? No, it means that this, this is quality and the world recognizes Italy quality worldwide. We produce 50% of the luxury production of shoe in the world. We, in Italy, collaborate with every big corporation from the big, two, the, the big French um, corporation uh, to um, many other um, uh, groups, multinational groups. And this is something we are pretty proud of. Uh, said that, uh, it's very important to see how Italy uh, became what it is today. It comes from an incredible creativity, but creativity is not enough to explain the success of Italian shoes, in my opinion. Something that uh, it must be told is we have an incredible technology and uh, an incredible development. But most of all, there is one secret ingredient, which is passion, which is uh, for every single in, uh, industry, creative industry of Italy. This is something really useful because it's a secret in the ingredient and it's not very easy to replicate. Uh, we, we come from uh, single shoemakers. Everybody knows the history of uh, Ferragamo, for example, or Sergio Rossi, or those big names that today are important companies. And this is something that is happening nowadays in an important transition from small uh, independent designer to multinational companies with offices worldwide. Of course, there is a long way to walk remaining in the shoe industry, but we are, I believe, uh, as an industry, um, having every single step to become even more and more relevant. Now, uh, we, as a Asso Calza Turifici, we also organize a show, a trade show, which is called Mica Milano. And we are proud that uh, Mica Milano is the hub for every single nationality. We welcome our friends from everywhere in the world, uh, from China to South America, from uh, north of Europe to Africa. And everyone with a quality product is more than welcome to exhibit in our show. We also have uh, nationalities coming and buying our shoes from 110 countries. Uh, and this is huge. And uh, as Linea Pelle it, in its sector, Mika is the worldwide leader. And we would love to invite you all to uh, enjoy our next uh, uh, physical exhibition between 19 and 21st of uh, September. Um, now, uh, I'm going to end my uh, introduction by saying uh, we have something that uh, it's pretty unique. I don't know if it, it's, it's good or bad, it's just unique, which are the Italian districts. 
We have seven different districts in Italy, and each district has its own peculiarity. Imagine in Veneto region, the land of Venice, as Veneto itself brand uh, Veneto, uh, around uh, Venice and Padova, another small city near Venice, there is uh, uh, some incredible production for women high quality shoes. And then we have another district, small district, still in Veneto, in the mountains of Veneto, where the technical shoes are produced. And this is also pretty amazing because the big names of ski and snow related footwear are produced in a very small area with an incredible um, high level of quality around the same district. And then we have Marche region, slightly below Bologna. There are two main districts there men and women shoes, middle high, and children's shoes. Amazing pl uh, place where uh, a lot, a lot of uh, companies produce uh, with uh, a supply chain that we call kilometer zero supply chain, meaning every possible accessory is there. Amazing. And then we have Emilia Romagna, where Bologna is, where there are incredible names like Pollini, Sergio Rossi, Gianvito Rossi, um, or Giuseppe Zanotti, other big names of uh, the shoemakers in Italy. And not, let's not forget Lombardy region, where Milan is, where we produce for every single big brands, Chanel, Louboutin, they all produce in Parabiago or in Vigevano. And we also have Naples area, famous for its craftsmanship uh, and especially for the men's shoes. Puglia region, uh, the very hill, uh, speaking of shoes, of Italy, it's where uh, some incredible sneakers from every big company worldwide are produced uh, and safety shoes. And this is also something that makes us proud. Italy, it's uh, not as that big, but we have uh, uh, really seven different, uh, uh, very diverse region. I missed one, Toscany, very important for many big brands. Of course, uh, Gucci, Ferragamo, they are there, and many others, especially uh, those that work with leather. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you are talking about it uh, in deep. Um, I'm here, available for everyone, any question? And again, I'm terribly sorry for being late. Uh, it's a very hard period. So thank you, Fabiana. Thank you, Fulvia, for your patience. Uh, you're, you're very welcome, uh, Tommaso, don't worry. Um, we, we can start with the questions before, uh, because we are uh, uh, going uh, towards uh, the, the half the hour, an hour and a half. So, uh, we have a, the first question with that I think it uh, can be answered by any one of you. Uh, it is in which ways nowadays has, has the consumer experience changed from the point of view of the luxury consumer of made in Italy products and particularly and particularly during the COVID situation. Um, I think that uh, both uh, uh, Mr. Paolo uh, uh, Amato and, and Tommaso and everyone can answer this. The consumer experience, uh, maybe Tommaso, because you are there, you can answer it first. And then Mr. Amato and then Michele. It's a question that it's uh, related to all of you. Please, Tommaso, because you are already there, go on. Absolutely, thank you, and thank you for the question. Very interesting one. Now, of course, we don't have the crystal ball, and so we don't know exactly what's going to happen after we will recover from the pandemic. However, we are incredible optimist people. We see positive things, even when the situation are uh, not as big, as good as uh, uh, we could uh, uh, hope for. Now, what happened, and this is a macro trend, they're saying the world is changing and it's changing fast. They're looking for more quality and they're understanding that uh, uh, what is uh, considered fast fashion, it's not good for the environment. Uh, not everything, of course, I don't want to generalize. There are specific situations, I'm not going to enter in detail. But for sure, what's made in Italy, made in Europe, in general, what's high quality. But there are a lot of good quality, even abroad. Uh, there's high quality as well in China, as well as in, in South America. I'm not saying just Italy is quality. I'm just, I'm saying though, that those companies that produce quality, they will have a, probably, a probable success after the pandemic because the consumer is changing so fast and luxury must go through this uh, um, disruption. Another big uh, impact is sustainability. 
Now, I am sure that Fulvia and uh, uh, Unic uh, explained to you how the tanneries in Italy are by far the most sustainable tanneries worldwide. And as a consequence, we being the client of those tanneries, we are already incredibly sustainable. And luxury, it's not just about the cost or the price. Luxury is about the quality. And now quality, it's also sustainable quality. We are at the forefront of it. Uh, third macro trend, and then I stop my considerations, uh, is uh, that uh, Italian um, products in general, they have a longer life cycle. Now, that's not the same as saying they have quality. Uh, it, does it cost more to buy a pair of shoes at 400 euro or 10 pair of shoes at 50? because that single pair of shoes of 400 euro will last way longer than the 10 pair of shoes that cost 50 euro. So total cost of ownership, it's something that is uh, entering in the mindset of many consumers when it comes to luxury. And in that specific, Italian products, uh, they can really have a win. Of course, we need to work on it, especially in communicating to the world and thanks to you and also this kind of events, uh, we have the platform to do so. So thank you again. Thanks to you. Um, I, uh, I, again, um, I forward the, the question to Mr. Amato to know what's his point of view on, on this point. So on the, how the pandemic has changed the consumer experience. Uh, I, I know you, you actually sell your beautiful bags to the Queen of England, but you know there is not only the Queen of England who makes the consumer experience, so... Of course, of course. No, no, I totally agree with what Tommaso said, because the, the, the people change and they want uh, merchandise uh, in very high quality in uh, any part of, uh, of the uh, object. So in this moment with the pandemic, we, we can see how the, uh, the test of the consumers change and they want quality, they want to be sure that what they buy, uh, and they want to, to, to touch uh, very nice things, very nice test in the hands, in look, in creativity. Unfortunately, Italian people and Italian company has a lot of creativity. You can see in the shoes, in the bags, in, uh, in, the, in the clothes. So uh, I think that in this moment, we have a lot of opportunity to, uh, to grow with our items because the, uh, we have a lot of competitors. Uh, what Tommaso said about the cost is better. One very nice thing compared to 10 low price because they cannot give you emotion, but for the shoes are very important also uh, the, the quality because uh, you stay uh, uh, you stand up and uh, the, the shoes must be very nice uh, because otherwise you have a problem with your uh, health and uh, uh, for the bags uh, what i can say uh, fortunately it doesn't exist only the queen elizabeth but a lot of queens stars and people that they love luxury and quality and classic elegance things uh, unfortunately the market uh, change in that direction they don't want to buy very quickly items fortunately okay thank you very much uh, i have a couple of questions for uh, michele lupi which i asked to approach here one is from anna turi and she said i have a question for michele lupi from thoughts it is very hard to enter the world of sneakers a market with centenary brands jordan added as gz as well as sneakers collectors how did you manage to go from moccasins to sneakers what strategy did you use by the way, I read an article on Hyperbase about the Silicon Valley Bull, it is great. So, <laughs> so it's to you for your answer and also on the other point we mentioned before. Here, I'm here again. So um, the point is probably we are not going in the, uh, with no code, the, the our, um, Goal is not entering in the uh, tough market of sneakers, but we wanted to do something a little bit new. So the idea of the, the, the first uh, name of, as I said before, the name of prototype 
of uh, the first uh, no-code product that was uh, Shuker, was mixing um, the classic idea of the Italian shoe and the shape and using uh, special materials with the technology of the sneaker. So we are not in that um, business, but the, the idea was to give to our clients a shoe that was a, a sort of a sneaker, but it's a, it's a sugar that was, uh, can be used uh, in the morning, in the afternoon, and even in, 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 um, in the evening. I think the interesting thing that uh, uh, it was, ve it is, no code, our no code product, it's really, really successful in, uh, in, 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 in China, especially, it's our biggest uh, market, because probably we offer a, a different um, uh, kind of sort of a sneaker because so we are less uh, uh, rubber and plastic than a traditional uh, sneaker is made in Italy is uh, hand uh, uh, crafted and so maybe somebody that wants to have something uh, still elegant but with the informal idea of a sneaker uh, can can choose a, 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 a no code so we are not in that market with straight with the big names of, of, of sneakers but we are trying to offer something that is a little bit between a classic italian shoe and the informality of, of the sneaker okay. okay thanks thank you i i think that michele michele has to leave us because he has his Young daughter. Yes, I have to collect my daughter for dinner tonight. So okay. she's waiting for me. <laughs> so Thank you very much. Family issues calling. So we have another, another couple of questions. Uh, what did you do about digital production? Yulia Bida. Uh, Yulia, can you uh, explain a little bit more who's referred to about. Um, Digital production, what do you mean? Um, um, was it addressed, I think, to Michele, which unfortunately had to leave? Uh, digital production of what? The communication? Or the digital production on 3D? On, I don't know, models, shoe models, or whatever? My question to all guests that. Sindu Rustamani. Uh, no, I, I, I'm sorry, but I don't. Uh, Sindu Rustamani, you asked my question to all that, to all guests. What is your question? I don't get it. Uh, another from yeah because we have two places where people are sending uh, questions. Another way, uh, please answer. Okay, for Tommaso Cancellara. Tommaso, do you think that Made in Italy will receive more success for its sustainable approach? I'm referring to the lasting feature of Made in Italy product. So it's to you. Uh, I, I think sustainability is a big part of uh, the future of uh, Made in Italy, uh, as uh, the market is asking. Uh, as I said before, for sure, is a differentiation uh, aspect. It's not just because uh, you can't just be sustainable. You need also some quality uh, behind your product. And so I believe that it's not the only possible um, strong point of Made in Italy. Certainly, it's one of. Uh, again, what we I, I think that Italy is known worldwide for it's for its creativity and creativity is a part, of course, of uh, uh, a made in Italy product. But again, I want to stress the fact that uh, our companies, uh, Paolo Mato and uh, all the uh, and Dots and all the companies. Uh, 
they have an incredible level of technology and innovation. So heritage and innovation, they are really together in creating made in Italy product. It's not just heritage. Heritage is super important. Heritage is how we came to this point, but it's really super innovative. And that's why the creativity of Italy, it's envied by worldwide um, players. Now sustainability matches all of these topics and becomes a transversal um, key point for everything. But it's not an insertion of something else. It's within the quality that is produced by Italian products. Fabiana, say muta. Sorry, right. times I forget. Uh, considering that a quality product will cost more in a time of economic crisis, how do you manage increased sales by selling an expensive product? Uh, this is a question that is uh, um, maybe uh, to, get, uh, to give to both to Mr. Amat and Tommaso Cancellara or uh, not, certainly not to Fulvia. So, uh, my my opinion, um, well, my my single opinion is that uh, seeing that most luxury houses has actually um, made their exp their prices higher or after uh, and during the pandemic, like Louis Vuitton, like Chanel, like Hermès, everyone raised their prices they not went low because they knew that a certain at a certain range of consumers and clients will be lost so they uh tried to set up a new standard and a new benchmark with a kind of pro with a, a kind of people and that were, uh, had no problems. I have the, the, the uh, I have to tell you that um, uh, for one that you can think, uh, there is more money around and more liquidity in markets in the international markets now than never, ever. So as soon as the pandemic will be over, I'm sure there will be an outburst of economic boom. Uh, as all, it always happens after wars and after big crises. But don't even imagine that even if a lot of people have lost, unfortunately, their jobs, there is no more uh, money around. It's full of money around. So um, I don't leave, uh, I, I ask uh, uh, Mr. Amat if you he wants to answer this point. And how do you manage to increase sales by selling an expensive product? And then to Tommaso Cancellara. <clears throat> what uh, Tommaso said before is true. We increase the technology in our companies. Don't, the reason is not uh, um, increase the production, but increase the quality. What does it mean? We, we have some special machinery like a plotter, uh, but we use AutoCAD 2D or AutoCAD 3D. And uh, of course, all the items that we make with the, this kind of uh, uh, system to work increase the precision and the quality of the product, but decrease the cost to produce our items. So it's very important to uh, maintain a certain level but reducing the cost and maybe increase the quality. How you can do this? Using the uh, technology, uh, like uh, in fact, uh, the, the 3D, for example, we are uh, one of the, I think, as a small company, uh, in a particular position, we design and create also the accessory, means the closure, the attachment, the, the frame for the bags, but in the past, to develop, we ask to the supplier to design, to develop, try, and then we receive the accessory and we test if are big enough, uh, they work well or not. In this case, with the 3D, also with the printer 3D, we prepare the items 
and we check immediately uh, if they work well on the bag and then we give the uh, the item in 3D in PLA or other materials in BSA and we give to this supplier copy and realize in a brass a cover gold, cover silver, uh, whatever you want and we save a lot of money in uh, the uh, development of the project and this is a very big part, a very big component for the, the cost of to, to produce one, uh, one prototype, uh, one uh, one collection, and I think uh, uh, we are after the the shoemakers because they are very organized with the, with the machinery, and this to obtain the very nice items at the very nice price. So this is the only way to 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 uh, to be a competitor for the brands uh, for the companies out of the Europe like uh, Asia or that market as a supplier of uh, items, uh, bags and, uh, and shoes. Okay, right. Uh, I think that you already started answering one of the questions that Yulia has sent about the digital design of shoes bags. Oh, please, students, you can't ask something like, oh, what's the point of making something new and in... Uh, what's the origin of being creative? Because it's, it's, it's not a question, this is a course. And this is like living in a place for years. This is not a question, boy, uh, guys, please. So make uh, questions that can be answered. So uh, what's the origin of creativity? Uh, we are trying to explain that to you all over at all these meetings to make you understand that it's a mix of many, many things like history and like uh, making exercise and trying to prove your uh, strength uh, on on different products, but uh, please don't ask the origins of that, something that nobody knows about. It's just uh, exactly exercising. So, um, and did we have another question. So I think it's the last one because we have to leave. So, for both, for everyone, uh, which are the toughest problems in which it, and this is uh, Tomas? This is just for you because you you made your. Uh, afternoon out of this, the toughest problems tackled by made in Italy brands nowadays? This is a proper question. We, we need three more hours to, uh, to, uh, <laughs> to answer that. Um, I don't think that uh, we have problem as made in Italy. Uh, I mean, the, the problem is the pandemic uh, and so this is the, the bigger answer. Uh, the more precise answer is a series of uh, uh, problem, problems, but for sure I can mention a couple that are pre, during and post pandemic. Uh, the shoe making process as well as the bag making process and Leo Locati, Mr. Amato knows better than everybody else, uh, uh, it's so specialized. And uh, the um, handmade uh, part of these industries is so important, even compared to many other industries, that we have a lack of technicians. We have a lack of knowledge. I mean, we do have the knowledge, we don't have people to work on that knowledge. So what we need is young, uh, great um, workers that they want to un that they understand that uh, uh, working in a factory it means working in a world of creativity it's cool actually and it's not just you know moving around the leather or heels or accessory is uh, a, a really a world of creativity and uh, you know that tv program master chef okay imagine how cool it be has become to become a chef now, we should do something like this in our industry. We should have the master fashion and let the young people understand how cool is our industry, because it is very much. So this is a problem we have. Now, the problem related to the pandemic, I'm not going to enter the detail. There's so many, but everyone in the world has, said that has the same problem. Maybe Italy in some specific more, but then other countries in other. Uh, we are... In Italy, so proud we have a manufacturing process. And this is true for many European Southern uh, countries, 
but northern countries of Europe, they don't really have manufacture. U.S. is trying, with, the, with Donald Trump tried for four years to bring more manufacturing in the U.S. The manufacturing uh, industries are the past and are certainly the future because the world that could be digital as much as you want, but uh, at the end of the day, we do need, yes, we do need the hands. Hands, head hands. and heart. These are the three main categories of Italian production. It's in, in uh, DNA. Yeah, we have just, an, uh, just to, uh, there is something that I'm afraid it is related from, um, to uh, what uh, Fulvia has fought for a very long time. So one is from Turan, Hai Baili. He said, uh, I think it is for uh, Mr. Amato, is there interest in handcrafted fabric handbags? I make the handbags exclusive and I'm interested in starting a business in this field. So fabric handbags is something that Mr. Amato makes. And there's again for, from Anna Turi, and she said, your brand is leather accessory and it is not just leather, uh, Anna. Uh, did you ever consider introducing, oh, and she says, eco leather. Uh, dear Anna, eco leather doesn't exist and you are, I'm, I'm afraid, forbidden to use by the EU to use this, um, to use this uh, definition which is put an out of um, uh, out of order, out of law, uh, to expand the market and other alternatives to embrace environmentals. I must tell you that next, on our next meeting, we will talk about sustainability. And I'm afraid there is a lot of hypocrisy and there is a lot of bad in, in misinformation about what eco leather is, which is actually, for most things, it is plastic. So, uh, and or uh, it is, uh, it has a lot of plastic use for uh, making even, I don't know, uh, out of mushrooms or other uh, uh, pineapple leather or this kind of, uh, of this kind of materials actually use plastic uh, elements to be tacked together. So uh, it's not very easy, but we'll talk about this uh, uh, on our next uh, meeting. But I will ask Paolo Amato to answer Turan about this fabric handbags, because you actually made, as you showed us, also for Queen Elizabeth, um, fabric handbags. Uh, the, the fabric that we produce, uh, in this case, is this bag. You can see there are some thread in uh, real gold and silver uh, woven uh, with, uh, with the loom. Uh, the, the characteristic of this kind of material is metal, but without the memory. Means that you can open and you don't destroy, you don't change the quality of the material it is not like iron that remain like this or you cannot open. This is the characteristic of this kind of material. And we are specialized and unique company in the world that produce this kind of, uh, of material. Uh, fabric is, is a, a completely different story compared to leather, any kind of leather. Uh, any, any leather uh, has its uh, characteristic peculiarity, but also in the fabric you have the same uh, the same problem. For example, if you use a uh, Japanese thread, uh, the Jap Japanese fabric, like uh, the fabric that we can use for the kimono or for the obi, the belt of the kimono, or use uh, our uh, our fabric or use uh, silk, any kind of fabric has its peculiarity. Also, the needle that you use in the stitching machinery change completely. Otherwise, you cannot work on this kind of material. It's very complicated. Uh, it's not so easy to use uh, a different kind of, uh, of uh, fabric. You must know the, the uh, characteristic of each uh, kind of thread. Okay, thank you so thank much. You. So I think that we're over uh, now almost a couple of hours. We had the chance 
to um, work on and to have some information and to share some views about the origins of heritage and the origin of Made in Italy. So uh, I, I, I ask uh, Fulvia Bacchi to uh, make the conclusions for this uh, talk that we have of today and uh, to um, say goodbye to everyone till the uh, April 22nd when we'll talk about sustainability and it's your point on Eco Leather. <laughs> Thank you all for attending this interesting meeting. I want to thank Tommaso for introducing the important topic of sustainability. And our next appointment will be on this topic. And there are a lot of things to explain about sustainability. So thank you for attending. And I give you the ne our next meeting will be on the 22nd of April always at the same time yes and uh, thanks to thanks for and thanks to mr paolo amato Tommaso Cancellara, and uh, michele lupi who went to fetch his daughter who i don't know which <laughs> meeting or things to do so family issues too you, you know thanks to everyone bye thank you thank you thank you grazie thank you. grazie arrivederci arrivederci, arrivederci grazie a tutti. salve chiudo